Uh, my name is Paul Jossen. I am the co-founder and co-director of this series. Um, our tagline is the world we make and what it means, although our very first speaker said, wait a second, second, it's not that simple, which I think is good that in fact our technologies make us too. Uh, but that's part of the point of having this series. It's given us a chance to have uh, people who are doing work in the humanities and the arts come and talk about the technologies we make, um, technologies we have made, and technologies uh, that we might make. I just want to make a few um, comments about the rest of the series. Um, first, by thanking uh, a number of people. Um, this series, this semester, has been sponsored by um, grants from the Teagle Foundation, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, College of Architecture and Design has worked with us, as well as the Marburger STEM Center and uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, so we're very grateful for all of those partnerships. Um, I wanted to also announce our next speaker. So on December 13th, uh, at 1230 in S100, which is on the main Southfield campus. Um, Professor Franco Pastili from Indiana University will be giving a talk entitled Integrating Neuroscience and Cloud Technology to Break Through Institutional Barriers to Education. Um, and the, sub, the subtitle of his talk, it's got a long title, but the subtitle is uh, Cloud Knowledge, Education, and the American Dream. And the idea here is how can cloud-based com computing and cloud-based data collection and sharing opportunities create new kind of ed educational opportunities? So if researchers no longer are holding all their data in a particular site but are making it available over the internet and sharing that data and sharing um, you know, interpretations of that data, what can that possibly do as a way of sort of um, democratizing education? So it's definitely a way in which technology not only creates new knowledge but also cre creates new uh, forms of access. So that is uh, the talk that will be coming up in December. That will close out our fall series, but we have three of the four spring talks lined up, and hopefully by December we'll have the fourth one in place as well, so we'll be making an announcement um, about that. If you have, I don't have a link to it right now, but I, our website is still very much in progress, but if you Google Lawrence Technological University or l2.edu, uh, Humanity and Technology, you will find archived videos of our talks thus, semester, thus far. Um, and uh, Sophia's talk will be on there in a few weeks. Um, so we have Catherine Hales' lecture there. We have a round table on Frankenstein there. So please do use that, share it. Um, we just ask that you don't put it on YouTube because not all of our speakers uh, want the material up on YouTube. So with that said, I'm gonna turn uh, it over to Franco who's going to introduce our speaker. Good evening, everybody, and this is going to be the second presentation. I will change it a little bit <laughs> to make it more dynamic, but um, essentially, uh, it's a big, big pleasure uh, for us to have Sophia Bruckner here um, um, as a speaker in our Humanities and Technology series. Um, sometimes our Humanities and Technology speakers are technologists. Some other times, they are humanists, but like we so from the discussion before, we are really not sure about <laughs> Sophia. <laughs> I, I'm not sure about myself either. <laughs> so Sophia Bruckner is a combination of a designer, an artist, and an engineer in one single person. She was born in Detroit, Detroit, inseparable for computers since the age of two. She believes a, she's a cyborg, and she's probably going to explain why she believes it. I will, or try. <laughs> She received her um, Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Applied Mathematics from Bar Brown University. As a software engineering at Google, she worked on the front-end development and interface design of products used by tens of millions and later on experimental projects within Google research. Bruckner, Bruckner earned her MFA in Digital and Media at Rhode Island School of Design where she explored the simultaneously empowering and controlling aspects of technology, particularly within users' experience design and computer programming through her, her artwork. As a researcher at the MIT Media Lab in the Fluid Interfaces Group, she combined the understanding that interfaces structure thought processes with ideas from cognitive behavioral therapy to design and build interactive devices for mental health. Bruckner feels an urgency to understand and raise awareness on technology's controlling effects. 
and to encourage the ethical and thoughtful design of new technologies. To do so, she teaches science fiction to science fabrication, a course combining science fiction and invention. Uh, and since, since 2011, uh, she taught class, uh, multiple versions of the class to students and researchers at MIT, Harvard, RISD, and Brown. Both the classes itself, as well as the students' individual projects, received inter international recognition and were featured by Smithsonian Magazine, The Atlantic, Studio 360, Scientific American, Fast Company, and many others. Bruckner's work has been exhibited internationally, including the Peabody Essex Museum, the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, and the leader in software and art conference in New York. And she is a fellow at the Dalai, Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values. She is especially interest, interested in application of embodied cognition to interaction design, wearable technology, digital fabrication, generative systems, sound, and as a technology antidote, painting. Her ongoing objective is to meaningful, meaningfully combine her background in interaction design and engineering with a perspective of an, of an artist to create new technologies in the service of mental and physical well-being. When two years ago I had the opportunity to see her speaking at the University of Michigan, I immediately thought that her ideas were of great relevance for the understanding of the current industrial revolution. As soon as we inaugurated the lecture series on humanities and technology, Paul and I felt the, the immediate urgency to invite her to share her ideas here at Lawrence Technological University. And here is she. Okay, thank you so much for that very lovely introduction, and I'm so glad to be here. And I'm, I had a very nice time chatting with the students before, um, before we started. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about my work, and um, I, I, I realize I am a kind of a confusing person. <laughs> and so the way I kind of describe myself these days is I say that I'm a futurist designer, artist, and engineer. And um, while my work is very um, interdisciplinary, I think, and I'm working in all these modes, the thing that kind of ties everything together is that I, I really focus on thinking about preferred alternative futures and how, um, how my work can um, persuade people that we can uh, achieve these kinds of different futures. Um, sometimes I also describe myself as a full stack prototyper. Um, and what I mean by that is that I can envision ideas, but then I also have the necessary technical skills um, and design skills to execute a prototype that can meaningfully convey those ideas. Um, this involves um, design and a sensitivity to aesthetics, fabrication, programming, um, being comfortable with basic electronics and sensors. And while the final product um, that I might want to make is not even close to the, um, uh, be, uh, might not be executed even close to the same way, um, I think being able to implement a robust prototype is really invaluable to communicating a particular vision and influencing what people see as possible. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, four themes in my work today, because um, I kind of like to shake up what people think of as an artist, an engineer, and designer. Um, so I'll tell you like, what I think that means for me. Um, so I use science fiction and futures research to promote an ethical and extrapolative design process to build a preferred future. Um, the deliberate exploration of what kinds of futures are possible, what are probable, and what futures are preferable, um, this gives me a conceptual framework to choose which te technologies I should critique and which possibilities I should prototype and test. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier, too. Um, so when, we're talk when people think about the future today, um, I see this really unhealthy incl inclination to cling to one of two extreme views. Um, so at one extreme, I see this attitude of blind optimism for how technology is the perfect solution to every problem. And at the opposite extreme, I see this unconstructive attitude um, of pessimism where people can only see how technology is ruining everything and they struggle to come up with alternatives. 
And I think this black and white thinking results in a sense of hopelessness that paralyzes people from taking action to speculate on and build a preferred future. So to put that a little more simply, I think it makes people lazy. So if you believe a dystopia is, is inevitable, you, you're just gonna do whatever and be lazy. Um, and if you're, you just believe technology, no matter how you throw it at any problem is gonna be fine, you get lazy too. Um, so I, that I, I very strongly believe that we should uh, be encouraging a different way of thinking about the future. Um, a really good example of this type of binary thinking was in a New Yorker article last year about Silicon Valley executives. Um, so for some reason, all, very many people who are executives in Silicon Valley are also doomsday preppers. Why is that? <laughs> Um, and there's this really striking quote in there. Um, so, by the way, doomsday preppers, they means they have bunkers and they think the world is going to end and they've already prepared for the end of the world. I think that's a very scary, uh, why, why, do people, why are the people who are building um, the technology that affects us all and is going to be influencing our future that cynical that they're building bunkers? Um, and the, the, qu the quote in the article that really struck me was from a, a Silicon Valley executive was, um, my current state of mind is oscillating between optimism and sheer terror. Um, and so in industry, people are oscillating between these extremes, but I also see it um, in the world of research, in the world of tech, in the world of new media art, and I see it um, in, with average consumers, and I see it in my students. And I mentioned this earlier, that I have students, we watch Black Mirror episodes, and they see these Black Mirror episodes as completely inevitable, and they don't see a way around it. And I can't imagine that a, student, a young designer is going out into the world thinking that Black Mirror is an, an inevitable future. So instead of clinging to these extremes, I believe we need to cultivate an attitude um, that I call um, critical optimism, which is a more balanced approach of earnestly proposing ideas, um, but not without the healthy dose of criticality needed to pre prevent or mitigate misuse. Um, so uh, that's just a little intro to what I do now, but I wanna tell you how I got here. Um, so I wanna explain to you how I, um, I, I, why I care about this, and um, I also want to, you know, admit that I used to be guilty of clinging to these extreme views, um, and until I was forced to change. Um, I don't. Uh, so um, he, here, uh, you can hear why my first computer I got when I was two. It's a Commodore 64, and we've been in, I've been inseparable ever since. Um, and um, but throughout it all, my relationship with technology has been quite intense. And like people from my generation, this is quite unusual to have a computer from this age. Now it's quite normal. Um, and there's a real difference um, for, for, for how computers shaped me because it was before there was the internet, but now people have the internet, which is changing all the time. So um, I can only speculate on how um, growing up with technology today is affecting the way, um, the way people uh, think and see themselves uh, in the world uh, now. So, after I, you know, was a complete computer nerd my whole life, I went to, I, you know, I studied computer science, um, uh, and I spent nine years really thinking about uh, technology from the point of view of, as an engineer. So I was one of these people in Silicon Valley that I'm complaining about now. Um, and um, I designed and implemented apps that were used by millions of people, and um, I was one of the biggest, um, this, you can remember a time before smartphone apps, there were homepage apps, and I was one of the biggest app developers in the world. Um, so each of my apps had probably several million users. Um, and uh, the crazy thing, because it, it was the early days of Google, is I got all the user email, the customer support emails to me directly, <laughs> instead of to some customer support service. So that, I think, was an amazing experience that changed the way I think about what I do forever. Um, engineers don't normally get to see those emails, they just see the aggregate numbers, or like 1,000 people complained, said it was a problem. Um, but I actually got to see, the, like, I actually read my users' words. And so what I saw was um, every tiny design choice um, really affected people. I could either create um, incredible delight or incredible frustration. Um, and I had a huge impact, but it uh, taught me a lot of humility as well. Um, sometimes I would be asked to do something that, uh, for some reason, that I knew was going to bother our users, and I still had to do it. We would launch it, and I would get these emails that people, people wrote these emails that were so, like, they, they wrote them like they were completely like, violated like, and betrayed by us um, for having implemented this negative change, and it was really hard to read those. And it was because I, I realized that people were structuring their entire day, or even life, around our product. And so every tiny design choice actually was, was really making an, had an enormous effect on people. And so I got, I got, eventually got really frustrated being told what to make. <laughs> And I wanted to be the person who was deciding what to make, because um, I found that those kind of moments very hard. And so that's when I returned to graduate school to study art and design. 
And so then I spent seven years, now more, more than seven years actually, um, reflecting on technology from the point of view as an artist and designer, although I've never, you know, I've never put being an engineer aside, of course. And now I'm at U of M. Okay, so more storytelling. Um, so while I, was at, uh, while I was in art school, so this was, uh, I forget how many years ago this was, I decided to paint all of my computers from memory. Um, so this was my Commodore 64 that I painted from memory. This, remember, this is one I got when I was two. And this was my, uh, my computer when I was in maybe third grade or fourth grade. It's a Dell Dimension Pentium II. And I, again, I painted this from memory. And so while I was painting these, I noticed something really kind of uncanny about the way I was painting them, and it was not intentional. I realized that they look like this. And I don't know if, if there are gamers here, so maybe you'll recognize what this is. Anybody know what this is? It's a classic game. Anybody? Yes, awesome. I can't believe you got it. <laughs> Uh, I got, I very often, I, people in the room don't know what it is anymore, but this was um, a very, this was very typical um, game from the late 80s, mid to late 80s um, for DOS. And it was, uh, it was like, it's a classic and I played a lot, I spent a lot of time playing games like this. And uh, what I realized is that I had painted my memories um, in the style of the way space was represented in these games. And I didn't do that on purpose. And it wasn't just um, the strange use of perspective, um, which you can see here. Um, it's like before point perspective existed. Um, but there was also, I also like, there's an unusual level to details like things like vents and windows. And um, I actually did that in what I I actually um, was remembering like things like vents as being important because things like vents were important in those games. Because uh, that, that was, there was always some clue hidden in a vent. And uh, the windows were really pixelate, uh, pixelated in these games, but that was because the pixels were huge. But when I remembered the scenes outside of the window, I still, you know, abstracted it like a pixel, like making it look pixelated. Um, so, like, I, what I think, uh, what I, what I realized is that by playing these games all the time, shaped the way I think about uh, space and also my percept and my memories. And so, this is when I say that we're all cyborgs, but most people don't realize it. And when I made these paintings, I saw clearly that I was a cyborg, um, and I couldn't really disentangle myself from the technology that shaped me. Um, so uh, RISD, at, when I was at RISD, I think overall I was still in my um, very optimistic about technology phase, and I kind of just wanted to apply technology to everything, um, including art. And all of my work really reflected this enthusiasm and love for technology, um, like in this piece, uh, where I sang my C++ code aloud to my computer. Double quote, OF at clock window dot H, double quote, close paren, semicolon, int main, open paren, int I equal zero, close semicolon, I lesson not underscore video, OF at clock window, semicolon, I window semicolon, close paren, OF setup, open GL, open paren, ampersand, window, stream, stream. Okay, that's just a short clip. It goes on for a while. Um, and so, like many programmers, I know what it means to be in the zone. So if you're a programmer, you probably hear people say, like, I feel really in the zone. Um, and I describe that as this kind of like ecstatic flow state, um, which is this very empowered feeling where you're so fluent in the programming language you're using that you can express your intentions as code without having to translate them. So you're, like, it feels like code is flowing out of your fingertips. Um, but, however, to achieve this in the zone state, you have to adapt yourself to the interface and give up some of your humanness you have to make yourself think like a computer. And in this state, you can only think what the computer programming language allows. And this doesn't just happen with programming. Uh, more generally, user experience designers strive for this in their designs. The goal is for the user to be conscious only about what they are trying to do and to forget that the interface exists. And the interface is actually shaping um, what you see as possible, what you're thinking, and what you're doing, your, be your entire behavior. Um, so in this artwork, um, this is kind of still t focusing on how I, th I think technology is great. Um, I wrote a generative C++ program that sings its own code by mapping it to sound. I wanted to convey to a wider audience that pro to pro for programmers, code is almost poetic, and it's very aesthetic. Um, so I'll play this just for a little bit. So I carefully mapped the aesthetics of code to sound. Things like the good use of white space, um, which programmers talk about a lot, line length and punctuation, um, 
these are the things I used to map, um, map to the sounds. And all the sounds were created um, by using the computer as my instrument. So I used the built-in microphone on the computer, I used the keyboard, I pushed on the computer, I tapped on the computer, and I recorded my breathing and my singing, and that was it. And then um, the program is going through its own code line by line um, and producing this composition. And so what I really wanted to happen was that as I improved the code and it became more elegant, the resulting music became more beautiful. Um, and that is what, it, which is exactly what I wanted to happen. There were a few, few times I wanted to stop because I really liked how it sounded, um, but it, uh, but I like committed to the process and I, that it, like once I made my code as elegant as possible, that the output would be elegant, and it turned out to be the case. Um, but my, but also during this time, I like, th I was really forced to face my. Um, forced to reflect on my relationship with technology. Um, and I, I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't uh, continue to use it this way. Um, so like a lot of programmers, um, and especially women, you, I got really bad RSI in my wrists, so I couldn't type for about two years at all. Um, and for a programmer, that is pretty much the most horrible thing that could happen to you. I, I couldn't draw, I couldn't type, I couldn't do anything. Um, so un, uh, I was forced to use Dragon Dictate, which is like what at the time was the best dictation software available. Like um, speech to recognition is better now, but at the time it wasn't very good. Um, I was forced to use it for everything. Um, and uh, working through this software f completely interrupted that seamless, um, nearly ecstatic relationship I had with computers. And at one point I was trying to type like two sentences and it took me 45 minutes and I couldn't get it to type. And I actually cried when the software was running. And I recorded it. And now I, then I had the Mac OS X screen reader read the resulting text aloud. Um, and that, this resulted in this um, very um, unsettling yet slightly funny uh, type of poem. In the event, will, will him, 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 and him, and him, and him, and him. And him, and him, will, 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 him, and him, and him, and him, and him, system, will you who are of will and the will and will the, the the end end or it will go a little, I will. Yeah, sad. Um, so this was really a turning point in my relationship to technology, and the metaphor I like to use is that it's like before this moment, I was looking through, looking at the world through a clear piece of glass that was sparkly and clean, and I was just able to focus on what was beyond it, and I couldn't see the glass at all. But once um, I hurt, I hurt my hands, and I couldn't use the computer effectively anymore. Um, it was like looking at glass that was so dirty and so filthy that all you could focus on was the dirt. And so um, technology had once seduced me into these feelings of godlike superhuman empowerment, but I became pa painfully aware of its controlling interfaces shaping my thoughts and behavior, and that I had a very um, unhealthy and enmeshed relationship with technology's interfaces. And so now that I actually could observe you know, some of these negative things about technology and its interfaces, I started to wonder how it could be designed more ethically and positively, um, and this type of questioning has become um, very central to my work in teaching. Oops. Okay, so um, we talked about this earlier too. So th this le naturally led me to thinking about science fiction, starting to think about the future. How can we make something better? Um, how can we avoid things going wrong? Um, being at Google really taught me to think about scale. Um, and so one of the th main things I teach in, uh, in my class is how can you um, think extrapolatively about the future? And how can you think about instead of thinking about one future, how can you think of a spectrum of possible futures? Which ones are probable and which ones are possible and which one is preferred? And then how can we work towards that? So my, in my class, we read lots of novels, short stories, we watch films, we watch anime, um, and then the students build functional prototypes inspired by what, they build, uh, what, they've, uh, what they've read and watched. And uh, students learn to thoughtfully critique current te technological and societal trends and um, extrapolate them into the future. And I always encourage them to try, this is just an example of a few projects. Um, but I, I always try to get the students to think about um, how your technology might be good and how it might also be bad. I very much um, give them a hard time when they're making a, a piece of work that's only focusing on one uh, extreme or the other. And um, so 
science fiction, there's a lot, there's like a misconception about science fiction that it's predicting the future, but really um, a lot of science fiction is more about the present. Ursula K. Le Guin said that science fiction is not prescriptive, it is descriptive. And um, what she means by that is science fiction authors are examining current trends in technology and society. And they're looking at what people are currently worried about or currently scared of or currently afraid of or currently hopeful about. And then they're extrapolating that into the future. So you'll see that um, science fiction written during different decades is really very much exploring um, the issues of that, issues of the time that they were written. Frederick Pohl said that a good sci-fi story predicts not just the automobile, but also the traffic jam. Um, so, uh, which I think is very important. And that's, that's why, um, that's a very important, uh, I think this is a very especially important point for when I have engineers in my class. They're good at predicting automobiles, but they should also think about the traffic jam. Because one thing I learned at Google was um, once you launch something, it's pretty hard to change it, and usually you can only tack new features on. So uh, you have to be able to think ahead and try to avoid some of these poor design choices before you've, uh, millions of people are using them. Um, I'll, well, actually, this is a pretty famous example for this area. It's, this is Chrysler when they first launched um, the car that connects the cloud. And they somehow didn't think that, it, that people would be able to hack it. <laughs> and like a, for the first day they launched it, someone hacked I, I mean, I, it was like right immediately people hacked it and were able to make the car drive off the road. So like if, I, any, I think anybody who is, could like think, who reads sci-fi would have seen this as happening. <laughs> but um, so that's why I say if we can learn a little bit of this extrapolative way of thinking that sci-fi authors are so great at, it can give us insight on the ethical repercussions of what happens when our technologies scale. But it also just makes good design sense and good financial sense to think ahead too. I'm not just like, it's, it just, it's, it's just a good thing to do all around. So um, taking a moment to think about scale, um, I don't know if anybody here has watched this Black Mirror episode about social media. It's horrible. Crazy. This is the one my students believe is inevitable. Can it's you? Great. I, I showed this to my students. But I, 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 I was shocked that my students think this is inevitable. Um, so like what? And, but, I didn't uh, ask that. <laughs> Next time I will. Ask them if they think that if they, if, they, if they see us avoiding this future. But um, why, when, when we're designing these like social media platforms, what happens when you go from checking your social media a few times a day to a hundred times a day, which is now the average. The average now is a hundred times a day. Um, did the designers think about that? Uh, think about that leap. Um, how does life change when you're receiving hundreds of notifications per day from various online services? Are we just going to end up robotically responding to instructions coming at us from afar? And is this actually making us more efficient, which is what they're claiming to do? Um, and what happens when quantified self-technologies like popular fitness trackers are no longer something that you choose to use, but are instead required of you? And this is something that you already start to see for like getting lower insurance rates. I, there's like a university somewhere that requires its students to wear a Fitbit all four years. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty nutty. Um, and so people are now required to wear these devices. And so how, what are the implications of that? Um, I don't think that the designers of these technologies thought about that when they built these. And what happens when one of your five senses, like your sight, is completely mediated through the interface of one single technology, which is the ultimate vision of augmented reality? And what if what is driving all of these technologies is entirely profiting off of the collection of personal data in order to keep your attention on advertising? Because that's the business model most of these things are using. And so these are the questions we have to ask before we even start making an idea a reality. Um, because like I said, once you launch something, it becomes really, really hard to change the underlying architecture. Um, it's expensive, difficult, and risky for a company to change it. Um, and this is why I say reading science fiction is like ethics class for inventors. The creators, the creators of sci-fi are exceptionally good at imagining these possibilities. Um, and, so, and we need to be able to speculate on what happens to technologies they scale up. Um, but not just that, we need to speculate on the future of technology in a particular way. And again, I want to re I want to just emphasize, uh, I don't know why that looks not straight, but um, there's a t that you have to avoid falling to the two extremes, um, just like I did when I first started um, working with technology. For a while, I could only see the good, and I thought it was I should if I apply it to anything, it will make it better. Um, and then when I got injured, I could only see the bad. But what we really need to do is cultivate a more balanced approach. And I'll just go skip ahead a little bit because I think I'm going to run out of time. 
And so what we need is more people who can operate between these extremes and embody an attitude of critical optimism. Um, and I sometimes say uh, that instead of black and white thinking, what we need is more medium to light gray thinking. Um, it doesn't, that doesn't sound very, like, uh, I guess, uh, sexy, I guess, but medium to light gray thinking it would be a lot better than, than, than falling at these two uh, unhealthy extremes, which I think result in passive passivity and laziness on the, on the, on the part of inventors, engineers, and designers. And uh, uh, Ursula Le Quay Le Guin always has the right thing to say. Um, she, just before she died, she said that we need leaders who can see alternatives to how we live now, can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being, and even imagine real grounds for hope. And so I think one way to do that is to build prototypes, because um, once people see a prototype, they see something as possible, and they, they believe that that's a possible future we could have. So um, this futurist mindset feeds directly into the next theme of my work, which is I critique and offer, offer alternatives to industries, paradigms, and assumptions on how we live with technology. So when I look at a particular technological trend, I like to ask who's in power or who's vulnerable, um, who's in the know or who's in, who's in dark. How are our repeated interactions with technologies shaping our perceptions of ourselves and the people and the world around us? And could we do things differently? Do we want to do something differently? Um, so as an intro, this, is a, this is a quote by Donna Haraway that really inspired my next project. Um, she said that technology is not neutral. We're inside of what we make and it's inside of us. We're, in, we're living in a world of connections and it matters which ones get made and unmade. So, I definitely see this in new media work, but technology has allowed us to connect anything with almost anything, um, but many of these connections, I would say, are arbitrary or even exploitative. So if you could connect anything to almost anything, what actually constitutes a meaningful mapping? So um, I collaborated with a uh, fashion design, is that, a, that's playing, okay, good. I collaborated with a, oh, I don't want that sound. <laughs> Can I mute it? Yeah, I don't need any more sound. Okay, thanks. That, that music is way too evil, I didn't pick it. <laughs> um, I, collab I collaborated with a fashion designer um, from London named Rachel Frere to make this project which is called the Embody Suit. Um, it is a functional prototype that investigates these questions. The Embody Suit is a garment that allows the wearer to map personally chosen signals from an Internet of Things platform to physical sensations on the body such as heat, cold, vibration, or more, and more. These sensations can be constant or infrequent, subtle or jarring, singular or grouped, and they are entirely configurable by the wearer for both practical and poetic purposes. So you can see here, um, the person programs the suit. Um, it pulls data from about people, places, things, abstract data, other wearable modules, um, pulls those from the cloud, and those get sent as haptic signals onto the suit, that you, so you experience data on your skin. Um, for this project, um, I'll tell you just a little, since there's a lot of makers in the room, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, I designed and fabricated custom PCBs um, using both um, maker technologies and industrial fabrication technologies. Um, so these are the circuit boards. Um, in why, some of them use e-textile braces, some of them use wires. Um, the way the boards work is they actually have snaps on the bottom and um, the traces on the boards actually connect with the traces in the garment through the snaps. So um, it's actually, the, the, elect the signals are, are traveling through the snaps into the garment. Um, and what was really interesting about this project, um, and why I think it, I, even after I've made it, I think it's even more important to make it, um, is that when people, let me, let me go back to this picture. When people like see this in the, in the gallery or at a conference or I show them the video, um, they immediately start calling these circuit boards sensors. And there are no sensors on this garment at all. Um, and what I thought was really like, disturbing about this is that we've been so conditioned by um, industry to think of wearable technology as having sensors in it and harvesting data from you and sending it elsewhere that we cannot even imagine a way that you could have electronics on your body that doesn't do that. And um, sometimes in a talk I will say like, 10 times there are no sensors on this suit and people come up to me and still ask me about the sensors on the suit. People, oh, just, that's perfect because I want to ask three times. <laughs> now, where are the sensors? I know, I, I, it's just, it's there are no sensors. There are haptic actuators on these boards. So you're feeling physical sensations on your skin, but there is nothing, they, they're not measuring anything about you and they're not sending data anywhere. <laughs> 
you're receiving data. Um, I'm, we're purposely flipping this, uh, this, this, uh, this, in, this, I don't know, design paradigm. So it means that uh, this yellow things <laughs> are translating signals as actuators in, on your skin. Exactly. Actuators. Yes. It's reversing the thing. It's reversing. receiving signals through uh, this. Exactly. It's a complete reversal of quantified yeah. self technology. <laughs> But um, but I but the fact that people and this is this was this was across the board whether it was an arts designers engineers or just like random people who don't do aren't really involved um, everybody had this bias and so that, I think that's why it was even with a functional prototype it was it's hard to, to it's hard to tell people to get people to imagine a different way of living with technology. But um, if you think about how intrusive all the technologies we have now, once they're on your body, that's like five million times more intrusive. Um, and I don't want this to be the only way we, uh, sensors on the skin sending, harvesting data from us and sending it somewhere to be monetized. I don't want that to be the only way we have electronics in our body and software on our body. There are different, uh, there are other possibilities. And through this project, I'm trying to get people to realize that there are other possibilities. Um, and it's, I, I don't have enough time to talk about it, but really it's very informed by embodied cognition research. Um, so a lot of our, uh, much of our thought is unconscious, like 1% of our thought is actually conscious, and that 1% of thought is entirely dependent on like that 99% of unconscious thought. And um, the way we, when we feel things on our skin, it it's, has a very, very strong impact on our subjective experience. And so there's a lot of, of, lot, a lot of that thinking here. I'm thinking about how, how can we, um, no data in an ambient, unconscious way. But, um, not, uh, but not, the other thing that scares me is when people see this, they're like, they say that once they figure out there's no sensors, the first thing they want to do is say, so I could know when I get an email even faster. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think that should be the thing, what we should do with this either. I, I think it's very, I, I want this to be used for more poetic and meaningful purposes. Um, so like maybe some examples. Okay, one practical example. Um, let's see, I'm, I have to talk faster. Like, so say 20 minutes before it rains, you feel like a gentle buzz somewhere on your wrist or something like that. Um, and you don't need to be fully conscious of the signal. You just kind of have this um, physical, um, you know, just this mild physical feeling. And um, I was trying to think about, I was kind of inspired by the idea that um, when someone has an injury, um, you're bo you, like an old broken bone, it, you kind of feel an ache when the pressure changes. And so you have an intuition that the rain is going to, like the, the weather is going to change. So what if you could use a wearable to program that sort of an intuition into your own body? And so that's a really practical example, but what if you, what if you use this for something else? Um, so an, a, a, an idea I like is that maybe in your childhood home, whenever the sun comes out, you feel warmth on your shoulders. And so, if you, so you're really kind of blurring yourself with a place that's important to you that's far away. Um, and I like to think of my body, if you think of your body as like an envelope, through a wearable like this, you're kind of blurring the edges of that envelope, but you're doing it intentionally, and you're the person who's um, controlling it. Um, the haptic sensations are felt by you alone and not seen by others. So um, that's one reason why this is very hard to exhibit. I'm trying to make prototypes now that other people can actually, I'm trying to make this uh, a system right now that's really easy for other people to design their own wearables. Um, and build their own experiences, because there's actually nothing to see. Um, it's all felt. And I think I really want other people to feel it, and I really want other people to um, apply, uh, apply this technology to their own, um, their own meaningful mappings. And so I have, I have some undergraduates working on this right now. Um, challenging the assumptions of the quantified self, the embody suit is a garment of resistance. Instead of harvesting data from the wearer to be sent elsewhere, it allows the wearer to take data in through the skin. The embody suit is a way to rebalance our data ecosystems, taking back control of the configuration of our boundaries and the trajectory of our cyborg evolution. So again, I'm thinking about the future of wearables because I think we should configure our boundaries and we should design, what, uh, think about what kind of cyborgs we want to be. And we shouldn't just uh, accept the default that industry is presenting us with, which tends to be quantified self technologies that are harvesting data from us, sending it elsewhere for to help you be more efficient, whatever that means, and then um, selling it for, to be monetized and usually used for advertising. Um, by changing the way people live with data, we hypothesize that it will change the type of data that people create. So
This is just a, this is just a different prototype that uses more e-textiles. And more, more, more prototypes. It's ongoing. And so um, this really leads me to the next theme of my work. This project, could, I show it in galleries and I also show it at design conferences. I am trying to define a research, an emerging research. There's more than one, and I'm not the only person doing this. There's actually uh, quite a few people doing this, but we're all coming from very different disciplines. Um, but dividing this emerging research area that intersects design and human computer interaction with new media and interactive art. Um, blurring HCI with artistic inquiry, um, the kinds of questions as, an, as a researcher you could ask, what roles could or should interactive technology play in our lives? How do technologies mediate our perceptions and interactions? How do aesthetic design choices shape our relationship to these technologies? And how does this all change over time? And so I think about these ideas in my um, research, and these are also the things I try to get people to think about when I teach my science fiction class. I might have to skip this. Well, I'll, I'll talk about it very briefly. So these are two devices that are inspired by Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I don't know if anybody's read that, one person. So if you haven't, it, this is the movie, the book, the book that inspired Blade Runner. Um, but Blade Runner is totally different from the book. And the most interesting technologies from the book didn't make it into the movie uh, because they're not visual. And I'm really interested by those technologies that are in these books that are uh, not visual. Um, because the technologies that usually end up not being very visual are the ones that, that affect the way the character in the book thinks. So there, it's all, all, all the effects of the, the technology are taking place in the, in the character's brain, and there's nothing to see on the screen, and hence they never make it into the movie. So um, there was a device in, in this book called the, the um, Empathy Box, and I was just amazed by it. Um, so the, uh, the, let me just see if I have the quote on the next uh, slide. An empathy box is the most personal possession you have. It's an extension of your body. It's the way you touch other humans. It's the way you stop being alone. Um, so in this, in this world, people are really isolated. And the way they deal with their isolation is they, there's a, they have an appliance where they grab the handles. And they're connected um, instantaneously um, with thousands of anonymous people through just touch and just feeling. Um, so you don't know who they are, but you feel what they feel physically and also emotionally. And when I was reading this, I just kept thinking about, so this is Philip K. Dick's vi vision for social media, a social network. And I was kept thinking about how different it is than the one we ended up with. <laughs> the, like, it, and so I, I thought about how do I translate this into a physical object? And so I designed these two devices that are meant to connect many anonymous people together through the shared experience of physical warmth. Um, and they challenge the idea of existing social networks because they explore what it means to be connected to people through technology without the use of names, numbers, or pictures. So I like to think of it as like Facebook with no names, numbers, or pictures. Um, and what, what would that kind of be as a, as a, as a technology? So these are functional prototypes um, that actually allow you to be connected with strangers um, just through the experience of warmth. Um, and you might be connected with one or a thousand people. Um, I don't think I have time to to show the video. But both devices incorporate reciprocity such that comforting yourself uh, means helping someone else. Both devices are purposefully take time to activate and are deliberately slower experiences that encourage reflection and focused attention. So again, I'm not designing for efficiency. I'm designing for meaning, what, to make something meaningful. And both devices take advantage of how warmth is associated with human connection. And uh, one of the reasons I think uh, I was exploring warmth um, is because warmth has been shown to affect the subjective experience of loneliness and connection. And, um, it, and what research shows is that it's the subjective sense of loneliness that actually has all the negative um, health side effects and um, psychological side effects. It's not actually how many people you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. It's how, how, how you perceive yourself to be connected to people. So it's whether you think of yourself as being lonely or not. And so if you can build a device that actually affects um, your subjective sense of uh, experience of loneliness or your subjective sense of uh, being connected to others, you can actually have, um, I, I hypothesize that you could have a very, um, you, could, you, could, you, can have, you can have many um, benefits for people's mental health. And so this, this is really thinking about all those earlier projects I had where I was thinking about how technology was structuring the way I think through these repeated interactions. And it, that was happening um, not by my choice, but I could observe it. 
So now that I know that technology has this power over you uh, to structure your thoughts um, by, through these repeated interactions, which is just the nature of interacting with technology, what if you actually use that power on purpose to do something positive? So that's what this project was about. And um, so one thing I just like to make a note of is I show these in exhibitions, but this is not a great, this is not why my dream, my dream is to deploy them. <laughs> um, this is not the right way to experience work like this. Um, reading a paper isn't the right way to experience work like this. Going to a gallery where you become a spectacle is not the right place to experience work like this. Because I have the skills to make a functional prototype, what I'm really interested in doing is deploying them to real people and having these devices like, in people encounter these devices in their messy lives. And so that's why, I, for me, the, we were asking, talking about this earlier, is why I feel the prototyping skills are very important to me. Um, and what does it mean to be an artist who deploys things? Um, I don't know yet. Um, I'm trying to figure it out. Because <laughs> um, you still have to document the work somehow and share the results, but it's not gonna be the same as an HCI user study, um, which is uh, very, often very dry and um, they try to isolate variables, but I, as an artist, I just want to throw out, I want all the variables. I, I want it to be messy. So I'm thinking about how do I, how do I um, balance all these, um, all these, uh, I don't know, these different desire, desires in the project. And so that's what I'm working on now, is I'm, I'm really thinking about not just building one prototype, but how do I build 100 so that I can deploy them to people, and that the art exists in people's homes instead of in the gallery, although it can always be in the gallery too. Uh, here you can see I actually did, I did actually deploy these to people's houses um, and people tested them at home. And so um, that's, this is just kind of what I just said, is that I have to use all my technical skills to realize these works. And so it's very important that I, um, I don't just build props, I actually build functional prototypes that are aesthetically resolved. Um, they can't just be um, like puppets that are being uh, puppeted far away and they have to, they can't be like sort of um, sta stepping stones to some final technology. They really have to be finished enough that I can get a meaningful response from people. Um, and in the last few minutes, I was gonna just talk to you about the last project I just finished and I haven't even fully documented yet and it's the one that people, you asked me what is the craziest thing I've done. Um, so this is one of the craziest things I've done. Um, and uh, it's currently being exhibited at the National um, Museum of History and Science in Portugal and at a gallery in Bangalore is it right now. So um, I haven't taken pictures yet, but I'll tell you about this. This, is, this has been my secret art project that I've been doing for the last six years. It's called Captured by an Algorithm. And it, um, I don't know, does anybody read Kindle books? Nobody reads Kindle? Do you keep the popular highlights feature turned on? No, I do, and I am obsessed with it. I think it's the most interesting, Amazon has been making it harder and harder to, to find because they have no way to monetize this feature, so they don't care about it but I think it's so interesting. So um, when you read a, a Kindle ebook, um, if enough people have highlighted the same passage, it will show up in your book as a popular highlight. And I'll tell you how many people highlighted it. And um, this seems really like unrelated to my work from before, but it actually is related to my work. It, it, I realize that this is actually creating an anonymous social network um, through this like obscure al algorithm. Like, all these people are actually connected anonymously and they're sharing something, sharing something that they never really intended to share publicly, but it is being like shared publicly, but because it's aggregate, it's like you know, made in aggregate um, and shown in this way, they still have their privacy. Um, so they're, they're actually sharing things that they probably wouldn't otherwise. And so I am obsessed with this feature and I have been um, analyzing this feature for, um, it's kind of a, this is kind of like also to counteract all the dystopian novels I read for my sci-fi research. But I've been analyzing the top 100 romance novels of all time. <laughs> and um, so captured by an algorithm, um, there's also a software piece, but it's a commemorative plate series ce celebrating the singular fleeting moments and how common algorithms interpret the most popular romance novels. Um, so these are, I can show, these are actually the designs for the plates, which I just got printed. And here's an example of one of the plates. Um, so um, I've been co collecting all this data for six years. And, um, that, and I've been printing the porcelain commemorative plates. <laughs> and so each plate is actually made up of, um, I scan all the covers of the books, so I buy the physical books as well, and I scan the covers, and um, I use Photoshop's photo merge algorithm on them, um, which is the, the algorithm that is used to make panoramas from stitching photographs together. And because the covers of these books are also similar, it finds like these areas where it thinks the novels should overlap, 
And so it, it, that's how these images are created. They're all being stitched together by photo merge. And then each novel, each plate also features one Kindle popular highlight um, from a top romance novel, of which I've been collecting, I've, I have a huge database I've been collecting since 2012. Um, and uh, so these popular highlights are the lines in the romance novels that most readers highlight. Um, and the thing that really struck me about romance novels um, is that the things that people highlight are not what you would think. When you think about romance novels, you have this idea of what a romance novel is. It's like silly, um, there's like sexy stories, um, and that's why people are reading them. Um, but when you see, look at what people highlight, you would not realize that at all. Everything that people write, are highlighting is some sort of intense quote about loneliness, grief, um, resilience, uh, death, um, and then even like fem feminism. Like, so it, let me read you some quotes. Let me see if I can, oh, this is so small. Okay, I'll make this uh, bigger so I can read it. Don't look at my desktop. It's a mess. Um, so one, for example, is it truly so unfathomable that an imperfect girl might be perfectly loved? Um, she felt her aloneness all the way to the bone. She was alone in a way she'd never, wow, I keep being asked to join Xfinity. And alone in a way she'd never before imagined, as solitary as if she were an astronaut come untethered from the mothership, drifting unnoticed into an emptiness so vast it was beyond comprehension. So can you imagine that enough people highlighted that so that it showed up as a popular highlight and other people keep re-highlighting it? Like that, that lonely, uh, and a lot, that's not just one quote. There, I would say about half of them are like that. <laughs> just about like how alone people feel. Um, life continues to move forward and so have I. Um, defiant in the fa face of time, face, death, and destiny. Um, this one is my fa one of my favorites. One whisper added to a thousand others will become a roar of discontent. Um, and so uh, I've been saving these, and I've been, and I, wanna, and I, I really like, um, because the algorithm, every time you, I check the algorithm, um, it's always, you know, you get different results because it's, you know, done in real time. People highlight it, it changes it. Um, I think that's one reason I like commemorating them into the, on these porcelain plates. So you're, I'm, I'm capturing one moment in the history of this algorithm. Um, but I'm also um, showcasing these qu quotes. And it, I think it really um, makes you look at not just the genre in a different way, but also makes you think about the people who are reading them in a different way. Um, and really, I, um, they're, the quotes are both heartbreaking and hopeful. And, it's a, and again, I think it's a very interesting, this, uh, even though Amazon doesn't seem to care about this feature, I think it's just an amazing example of a, 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 a to completely different social network, a completely different way to use technology to connect people in, in, uh, that they could, you could have not done without the technology. Oh, here's another one. Oh, this one I, I, I just finished. I just took the picture of it this morning. Um, and so I guess I'll just, I'll just close and tell you, remind you again of my four themes so that you think about artists and design and engineering all differently. Um, I critique and offer alternatives to industry's paradigms and assumptions on how we live with technology. I'm working on defining the emerging research area that intersects design and human computer interaction and new media and interactive art. I use science fiction and futures research to promote an ethical and extrapolative design process to build a preferred future. And I use all my uh, technical skills um, to uh, to uh, apply to art and design and to build these prototypes so that I can actually do, like, get meaningful, uh, I can actually persuade people and get meaningful results um, about what would happen if a technology was this way. Okay, anyway, I have, I always put questions on my last slide. You can read them or not, but if you want to learn more about my work, I have a website. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. And so I've told you about my craziest project. <laughs> that was my secret for six years, and I've come out with it. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. I, I talked a little bit too long. <laughs> so we have uh, some time for some questions, please. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Thanks. Anybody? We get the question Yeah, because it's recorded. Yeah. Oh. It go, the microphone oh, okay. goes to the camera. Oh. Oh.
Okay, you mentioned something about like referencing the empathy box from the Android stream of electronic sheep. And knowing that world in that film, in that book, and also its adaptation, Blade Runner, there are humans, and then there are also artificial humans. Like, you have examples like androids or artificial humans in the film Alien, for example, replicants in Blade Runner. What are your thoughts on like the possibility of artificial intelligence developing and almost like getting a sense of humanity as well? How would that factor into your research and studies? Well, I talk about it sometimes. Um, as a computer scientist, I know like people ask me like, when do you think like a computers are going to achieve benevolence? And then I tell them that's not going to happen. It's going to be an approximation of benevolence that's based on the input that people give it. <laughs> Um, it's all approximations. Um, I don't think we're very close to that, actually. <laughs> um, in terms of like uh, androids and, uh, and, and things like that, um, there, I, I'm thinking about another MIT research, re researcher's research. One of the points, especially we watch Westworld in my class, one of the points I like to bring up with my students is not, um, they are, like, you, you see people acting very cruel to androids. Um, and you think about like, should is that okay or not? Um, is it ethical? Like, do the androids have feelings? Um, but rather than thinking about whether the androids have feelings, which is kind of the topic of uh, Phil K. Dick's book, I think one of the most interesting things to think about is, what does it mean if you are able to um, harm something that is so realistically human? So thinking about um, the ethics of what means for you to, if you if you are actually empathizing with uh, an AI or an Android, and you are able to harm them, what are, what are the effects of that on you? And so I think that's the more interesting thing to think about than whether the Android is feelings or is benevolent or something like that. I don't, that, I don't know if that answers your question, but. This isn't a question, it's just a comment. I love those plates. Thanks. <laughs> and, um, but isn't that just a modern way of, a very, of doing something that's really very ancient? I mean, it's just collage, right? You're, yes, kind of, you're using except, the technology just to put together a collage. Except that I'm, I'm using the, I'm using the algorithm, uh, the computer is deciding what's similar. <laughs> right. Instead of me. Yeah, I just loved it. I love it, it's beautiful work. Thank you. So yeah, that was great. I have like tons of questions. I'll limit myself to two. First, I'm actually amazed that people highlight romance novels, and it's not a like snobbish critique. Like it's actually intriguing to me. Like I'm wondering how, if that is a art of like a, a, an artifact of the Kindle itself. That like if the the highlight function is simple. You know what I mean? Like I can't imagine the old paperback reader of the romance novel carrying around a highlighter. I can't imagine it either. Yeah, it's just like just amazing. It's, well, to me. part of it is because the highlight is so easy. I I I, I was really struck by. It. The people highlighting these too, because I kept wondering, like, are you if people are really saving these quotes for later? Yeah, they are, because they are really dark, a lot of them. And so, what are they doing with them? Yeah. And then they all Amazon also bought Goodreads, and people share quotes on Goodreads. But if you look at the nature of the quotes on Goodreads and the nature of the popular highlights, totally different, because um, Goodreads quotes are intended to like make you look smart. Mm, right. <laughs> so it's all about like uh, ego, and in this case, it's like aggregate, anonymous social network, kind of like the empathy box. And so you see people really revealing their vulnerability. Hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm just fascinated by it. I just, I, I, I wish I could understand why people are doing this. Yeah, but I also, it just like, also, it's kind of almost like they're supporting each other, I sort of think, too. Because once you see, first, you have to cross the threshold where it shows up. So it's enough people have to highlight that crazy thing to, for it to show up. And then every time people run into, across it, they like, and they see 10 hi people highlighted this, they re-highlight it. And it's almost like agreement or moral support, I guess. Like, I feel that way, too. Um, and so it, then it kind of goes into a different mode. Yeah, it's almost like the like function, right? Like, I'm also going to like this particular sentence because I see other people liking that yeah, particular but sentence. Yeah, it's, but it, it's different than like because it's not about um, no one is getting the most likes. It's, it's kind of sh they're distributed across this network of people. It's not about one person getting the most. Yeah. And so that whole, like, uh, that whole, like, weird ego-driven uh, need to get the most likes and um, look the best on Facebook, that isn't there in this social network, yeah. which I, 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 I'm fast, I, I feel very fascinated by. So this is my second question. It's kind of related. Um, I was struck by your description of your experience as an early computer user with a non-networked computer, which was also my early computer experience. And um, Haraway's like connectivity comment, right? So like now, like we don't think of computing technology without thinking of connectivity. But if you were someone who was like, you know, 
you know, messing with your Commodore 64, it actually was a very different experience, really right? Different. Like this idea of like, it's you and the machine and it's kind of the pleasure of the puzzle of the, that's what I remember experiencing, well, like the sort of I, pleasure of the machine itself. So I was just wondering if you well, could comment also, a little bit on that. it was kind of a closed world, which was not like the, because there's no internet. Um, and so I really felt much more empowered in that environment than I do now. Um, because I, I, I organized, I wasn't having like, organ, uh, I was really organizing, like how I, organizing my interactions with it. Even, I mean, of course, they, I was like, influ, uh, like there's affordances, like certain ways are easier than others, but um, now everything, you, uh, you're being forced to update all the time, things are changing. I feel like everything is um, always in kind of a chaotic flux now on the computer. And it, it doesn't feel like um, my personal world anymore. Yeah, I see, I see two hands, or many hands. Yeah, so I was thinking about um, your reference to your undergraduates and and also your personal history with computers, and I wonder whether there's a challenge uh, to stay current, to feel like you are connecting to technology in the same way that the people on the bleeding edge of technology are, who are often the people who are, you know, in their early 20s or whatever. So is that something... Um, that is uh, something you think about, or is it just something that comes naturally? I do think about it. Um, I stay up. I do stay up to date because I'm. I stay pretty. I try to keep in touch with what uh, my colleagues at MIT are researching. So, I, and I also go to a lot of HCI conferences and I see what the cutting edge research is. In terms of like how my students use social media, I can't always completely empathize because I don't. Uh, want to participate in it as heavily as they do. Um, but I, I actually, I, I encourage, I, they make projects that I learn from, which is interesting. Like for example, I don't use like Snapchat all the time, um, and they do. Um, and it must be, that must be, influ like, and I, I don't, whatever they're doing is influencing their, like they think that Black Mirror nose dive, nose dive is inevitable. <laughs> um, so I, I, we talk about it. It's funny, actually, recently I had to explain to them what GeoCities was. We read Snow Crash, and I explained to them what GeoCities was, and they couldn't believe it. They thought it was the most charming thing they ever heard of. They couldn't imagine like, how you could navigate the internet without search, that there, there was even a way to do that, and like, what it meant to like, you're, you have neighbors, and you have a street, and they thought they were so charmed. <laughs> I actually do have a question about those plates now. Mm -hmm. So the, your <laughs> algorithm, your, I'm just, it's just fascinating to me. So that the algorithm that brings the images together, yeah. what were the parameters? Was it just randomly put, or did, were you doing colors, um, so it's, complementarity, it's the, like what? I'm not actually sure how it works, because I, um, I think it's proprietary to Photoshop, but it's intended to be used, so like if you took, if I went in this room and I took a picture, 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 it would stitch them all together into a panorama. Okay. Um, so it's really looking for the, the same things. Like, I see. It's and, clustering by similarity. Yeah, it's cluster. It's trying to assemble a big picture from smaller pictures um, so that you can take a big panorama photo. Um, and okay. because those covers of those books are all so dreamy and they all I have see. like road going to a gate, clouds, yeah. to another gate, clouds, castle. Like it just it kind of finds those things and lines them up. <laughs> You mentioned that, like, especially mentioning the Black Mirror app, so like all, almost all your students has like a very pessimistic view of the future you mentioned, but have you ever had a student that's had a very utopian or optimistic view of the future? Well, I do find that um, engineers sometimes have a very naively optimistic view, um, which you, some people call techno-solutionistic. Um, I skipped that slide because I was running out of time, but I, the, the, me, the common metaphor there is like if you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. So if you're an app designer, you think you can solve every problem with an app, and like you don't, you don't, you don't ask yourself like, is there a better way? Could this go wrong? They just think it's going to be good, um, and so there's a lot of like people naively creating uh, t solutions with technology to problems, um, and I that uh, is a type of I would say unhealthy utopianism. Um, but I, what I, f I find the most challenging thing is to get people to be in the, in the in between. So like think, propose solutions and try to work towards positive futures, but also still ha be able to critique them. Um, and so I actually, it's a, so it's actually kind of interesting. A lot of times I'm teaching like engineers how to do art, art critique. 
Uh, and then I'm teaching a lot of the artists and designers to actually feel like empowered enough to make a prototype because very often they think it's inaccessible to them or like that you have to be really like you have to be an engineer to do it. And really there's a lot of ways you can make a compelling prototype with very few things um, to tell a story. Um, I don't know if that answered your question either, but um, I would say I do see that I see a lot of naive utopian or like blind optimistic attitudes. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. I didn't see you. Sorry. Hi. So, my question is kind of like on your interactive like fabric that you had. I was curious about what you're trying to communicate to the users with the data and the haptic feedback, and like what are the different um, experiences felt uh, through um, the receivers, I guess. Um, it's really customizable, actually. So we, we're trying to make it really easy to do so people can create their own experiences. But for me, it's, I, I'm just, uh, so we were talking about navigation earlier. And one of the in projects that inspired that project was, um, it's a belt called the Feel Space Belt, I think is the name of the project, which was a belt of motors that goes around your waist. And it just tells you um, there's a, sm a tiny vibration that always points to north. And so I really like that project a lot because it gives you an ambient sense of north. Um, you don't have to consciously like interpret a number or a symbol or like turn right here or turn left there. You just have like this sense of north, and so then uh, and you don't even have to you don't have to be consciously aware of it. You just know it. Uh, and I then I I, I I thought that was really interesting. And I then I, I kept asking myself, but what 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 else, other things could I know <laughs> that way? And so then that that's inspired the project. I want to build a platform that allowed me to know things that way. Um, but maybe not just practical things like north or that it's going to rain. What, what are these kind of like poetic things? Like how can I actually make myself feel more ambiently connected to things that are valuable to me? Um, and uh, I think, I, I actually think the best way for me to communicate that to the user is to build a platform so other people can build, them, build these things themselves. Um, and I'm working on that. I hope, it'll, I hope they'll build things with it other than email note. I got a new email. <laughs> So um, I, I'm very interested in the um, in the coexistence and sometimes uh, um, the tension that I see between the two souls that are in you in your work uh, about the uh, engineer and the artist, right? And um, and also uh, it's very interesting the fact that you say I want to deploy the uh, the, the prototypes that I create, and um, so. Uh, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but um, what behavioral science and cogni cognitive science labs do is to test prototypes of things that can be, or prototypes of things or situation or experiences that are brought inside of the lab. And I see many of your uh, prototypes perfectly suitable, right, yeah. to this kind of experiences. Um, did, did you already did some work like that? Or? I, I started to, and I've been thinking about it. Um, and it could be in a lab. I just really want people to take things home. <laughs> I, I want people to, I just want to see what happens. Like, for example, the empathy box. I, when, I interview, when I took it to people's houses, I just, it was interesting to like, see what, did they put it in their office? Did they put it in their living room? I mean, I, uh, I wouldn't get that information from the lab. I, I really like to see how my ideas collide with their life. <laughs> Which, in this sense, uh, it's very interesting to me because I, I see the interactions. Now, for example, psychology has a very strange epistemology, right? It's really, I don't know, we don't know what we are. So it, I, I feel very um, involved yeah. in this. But in this kind of responses that you say, I want them to take the, uh, the, the prototype home. Yeah. That's the artist that is talking, yeah, is the not artist. the engineer at all, <laughs> no, right? It's, no. it's so interesting. Yeah, the, I, well, I, if I, it's pretty hard to measure things if I, everybody takes it home, because there's like nobody's life is the same, um, and it's very messy. Um, not controlled situations. There's no control. Uh, it's not like uh, I can't like uh, isolate variables. Um, but I, I wish I, I, I'm just interested in that. And I, I'm interested in like how I might document the results such that people think about things differently. I'm not necessarily out to prove anything, but I want to provoke thought so that people can think about how we live with technology differently, and that's why I want to—I want people to take things home. <laughs> oh, 
Um, one thing I'll add, though, is that I did read a lot of those studies for in, before the project, especially about like the perception of heat and a subjective experience. I read all those studies, and I knew that I didn't want to. I didn't want to test my project that way. This is a little bit related about the different ways in which you're kind of at the intersection of different fields. So I could imagine um, like you deciding to actually make a product and market it, or I could imagine you writing an actual science fiction novel, or I could imagine you doing um, actual like punditry or activism. So it seems like you're like so close to all of these alternative ways of using energy, but you found this very specific niche of fabrication-oriented science fiction art. So have you ever been tempted to go into one of these adjacent activities? Yeah, I have. People tell me to do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> they tell me I should make a startup to make, make what, what people try to buy those things from me because they think they're real products. Right. Uh -huh. um, or they tell me I should make a startup to sell them as real products. Right. Um, or a lot of people, I complain about how sci-fi is very dystopian, and so people tell me I should write one. <laughs> um, but I, but I, I don't know. I kind of think I'm still doing every all, of, and I, I am kind of an. I, I am like trying to reach engineers and designers and get them to think differently. So in a way that I am like kind of an activist. But I kind of think I do that all with the prototypes because um, I th the way I tell my students is like your prototype is a, is like you're embedding a science fiction story in an object, an artifact instead of a novel, each, each of these prototypes is a, like a, a sci-fi story. And so, I, and, and to do that, you actually need all the skills that I, I, I mentioned to, to, do it, to do it effectively. It has to be aesthetically resolved. You have to think about the context. You have to tell, think about the narrative. You have to think about the user experience. It has to be like reliable. It has to be robust. Um, and so it's all, all there in this, in this object. I think uh, we can thank Sophia. Well, I, could, I can answer one more. <laughs> yeah, one more question is fine. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> um, I, I noticed there's kind of a theme, like you mentioned, like getting an email notification from like wearable technology. Um, I'm just curious about your thoughts of that sort of like use and this sort of like marketing perspective, I guess, seems to be sort of at odds with what like at least you're, you're seeming to like want people to like consider like in technology like does the fact that something has to be has to be marketed like in order to like reach people kind of betray some of the intention of making something for someone well I think one thing I'm trying to break is there's this perception that all these things are free but you're actually paying for things with your attention because um, eyeballs on ads is how is the business model of all these things and that's why everything is driven towards notifications and harvesting data so once people realize they actually have to pay for things uh, with money something other than their attention um, I think we might move in a trajectory that's different so I don't know if I see it as at odds I think these projects are um, kind of highlighting that business model as being a problem and what else would I say about that I just want people to realize that things could be different. And I do, I actually, I do, like, I also, I, I open source things. And so I don't, I, you know, people can take, for the Embody suit, for example, I hope people will just, you can order circuit boards yourself. They're a dollar a piece. You can make it, you can make your own. Um, I'll, I'll share the code. Um, some, I, I, I don't always do that, but I, in, in that case, I, I want people to do that. These are all, te all the technologies that to make your own device are available. Thank you so much. <laughs>